Hello, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense, medicine and chemistry. Today we have 12 chemistry questions with answers. Get your pen and paper ready and let's see how many of these you'll answer correctly. This is the 10th video in my chemistry quick review playlist. I hope you watch these videos in order. Let's start by answering the question of the previous video. If the electronegativity of sodium is 0.93 and of chloride is 3.16, then the predicted expected type of bond in sodium chloride is nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, ionic or metallic. Can you answer this yourself? Please pause. Here is how you do it. You subtract 0.93 from 3.16, i.e. get me the difference in the electronegativity. So 3.16 minus 0.93 equals 2.23. After this, you go back to basics and you draw your timeline, so to speak. Is it less than 0.4? or is it between 0.4 and 1.7? Or is the difference in the electronegativity greater than 1.7? As you see, 2.23 is greater than 1.7, which means this is an ionic bond. But what if the difference was between 0.4 and 1.7? Then this is polar covalent bond. Have a less than 0.4 difference this is a non-polar covalent bond because basically when the difference in electronegativity is huge like this it means that chloride is way better at attracting electrons compared to sodium which means chloride will gain electrons and sodium will lose because chloride is more electronegative by a huge margin when one loses and one gains this is called ionic bond ionic bond is about give and take but covalent bond is about sharing here is another question a certain chemical reaction increases the number of gas particles in a system Therefore, this reaction is doing what to the entropy of the system? Is it raising it, lowering it, it's not changing, or it raises then lowers the entropy? Please pause. And the answer is raises the entropy. Why is that? Back to basics. Can we draw the molecules of a solid substance? Oh yeah, they are tightly bound like this. They are neatly organized like this. They are orderly. That's solid. How about liquid? Less orderly. How about gas? The least orderly. More order equals less entropy. Less order equals more entropy. Because entropy means disorder, the opposite of order. This reaction increases the number of gas particles, i.e. increases the number of disordered particles, i.e. raises the entropy. Next, if the temperature of A is 36.85 degrees Celsius and the temperature of B is 2.03 degrees Fahrenheit, what is the total temperature of A and B together on the Kelvin scale? Please pause. Okay, so first let's convert A into Kelvin. So Kelvin equals the Celsius plus 273.15. And since I know that the temperature in Celsius is 36.85, add 273.15 to this and you get an answer of 310 degrees Kelvin. As for B, which is in Fahrenheit, first you convert that to Celsius, which means Celsius equals 5 over 9, the temperature in Fahrenheit, minus 32. And this will give me negative 16.65 degrees Celsius. Plug the result into this equation again, and you get the temperature in Kelvin, which will equal 256.5. Then you add this number to this number, and the result is 566.5 Kelvin, which makes A the correct answer. Next, what's the proper scientific notation of this number? Please pause. Recall that the scientific notation has to be written like this. M times 10 raised to the power of x. And M has to be between 1 and 10, which means B is unacceptable because M is not between 1 and 10. How about D? Not acceptable. How about A? Also not acceptable. This number is not between 1 and 10. So if I have to make this between 1 and 10, I will go with 4.6. Okie dokie. And then ask yourself, what should I multiply with 
to get this number. Easy, I do it backwards. Look at the decimal point in the original number. This is as if there is a hidden decimal point here. And then go backwards. Here is once, twice, thrice, four, five, six, and seven. So that I end up with 4.6. So it's 4.6 times 10 to the seventh power, which makes E the correct answer. Next, here is a silver cube, and this is the length of the side, 5 centimeters. The mass of this cube is 10 kilograms. What's the density of that cube, please? The first thing is to look at the choices and look at the measuring unit. Here is kilogram over centimeter over cubic meter, gram over cubic meter, gram over cubic centimeter. You know already that density equals mass over volume. Okie dokie. And the volume is never measured in centimeters, so A is out. After this, unfortunately, I have to do the math many times to get these different measuring units. Let's start by kilograms over cubic centimeters. What's the volume of this cube? Well, if the side is just 5, then the volume equals 5 cubed, which gives me 125 cubic centimeters. Then the density is mass over volume. What's my mass here? 10 kilograms over the volume, which is 125 cubic centimeters. And this will give me 0 0.08. 0 0.08 what? 0 0.08 kilograms over cubic centimeters. Do I have this option here? Um, no, I do not have this, so I know that this is not true because it says grams instead of kilograms. Both of these answers have the denominator in cubic meters, so I need to convert my answer into cubic meters. Dimensional analysis, 0 0.08 kilogram over cubic centimeters. And as you know, one cubic meter has a million cubic centimeters because it's basically 2 to the third power and 2 to the third power is 6. If 1 meter contains 10 to the second power centimeters, then 1 cubic meter contains 1 to the sixth power cubic centimeters. Then I can cancel this with this. I have now 0 0.08 times 10 power 6 and the answer is 80,000 or just 8 multiplied by 10 power 4. What's my measuring unit? Kilograms per cubic meter. Kilogram per cubic meter. Is this the answer? No. C is incorrect. It's gotta be D, but I have to double check. Can I convert the kilogram into gram? Yes, by multiplying by a thousand. So this becometh 8 times 10 power 7 because we have 10 power 4 multiplied by a thousand, which is 10 power 3. You add the exponents, what do you get? 10 power 7, and that's the answer. Next, here is water alone. Its water level is 30 milliliters. Then we added a silver cube to the water, whose mass is 60 grams. After adding the silver cube to the water, the water level rose from 30 to 50 mls. Question is, what's the density of that cube? As you know, density is mass over volume. I know the mass. How do I get the volume? Well, it's the volume of water that was displaced. And the volume of the water displaced is the difference between these two numbers. It's 50 minus 30, which means the cube displaced 20 mls of water. Density equals mass over volume. What's my mass? 60 grams. And what's my volume? 20 mls. So my density is 3 grams per ml. I do not have 3 grams per ml, but I know that each kilogram has a thousand grams and each liter has a thousand mls. The thousand will cancel with the thousand, so it's also 3 kilograms per liter. Next, can you round this number to just four significant figures? Please pause. First, ask yourself this question. How many significant figures do I have in this number? Don't forget that leading zeros are not significant. So I have one, two, three, four, five significant figures. You just want to narrow them to four, which means I gotta sacrifice the seven. Since the seven is greater than five, five and up, you round up. So the answer is 0 0.05108. 
How many significant figures do I have here? Not significant, not significant, 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 significant. I have four significant figures. Next, each one of the following can be determined exactly, precisely, with almost no uncertainty. Except what? Please pause. Well, it is true that each liter has a thousand mLs, which means five liters have five thousand mLs, precisely, by definition. Which means this cannot be the answer because it says except. How about one hour? It has sixty minutes, by definition, which means we are precise, exact here, no uncertainty, which means D cannot be the answer. I know that a dozen of everything has 12 of that thing, so a dozen eggs is 12 eggs, precisely, which means this cannot be the answer. The number of pages in your notebook could be counted precisely, with no ambiguity, so that's not the answer. However, the distance between London and Paris is estimated. How about your height? Same idea, estimated. There is some uncertainty. It can never be 100% accurate. So the correct answer here is A. Next, which of the following archers was the most precise? Please pause. Precision is not the same as accuracy. Precision equals reliability, consistency. Who was the most consistent? This doofus right here. Even though he was far away from the bullseye. Exactly. Precision is not about accuracy at all. Precision is about consistency. A was very consistent. Hit the same spot or almost the same spot repetitively. So the answer is A. Next, here is compound A, which has 1.116 grams of chlorine and 2 grams of kappa. As for compound B, it had 2.232 grams of chlorine and 2 grams of kappa. Are compounds A and B identical or different? Please explain your answer. This question is about the law of multiple proportions. How do I answer this? It's about the mass ratio. You get the mass ratio for A and then the mass ratio for B, and then the ratio of the ratio. Let me show you. Get me the mass ratio of A. What do you mean by the mass ratio? The ratio of the mass of chlorine into the mass of kappa in that compound. I have 1.116 grams of chlorine over 2 grams of copper, giving me an answer that is equal 0 0.558. Let's do the same thing for compound B. For compound B, chlorine to copper mass equals 2.232 grams over 2 grams, giving me a mass ratio for compound B of 1.116. Then you get the ratio of the ratio. Mass ratio for compound A over mass ratio for compound B, and you get the answer of 1 to 2. Whole number, whole number, both are small. When you have small whole numbers, it means that this obeyed the law of multiple proportions, which means these compounds are different. Next, if 80% of all boron atoms have a mass of this AMU, and 20% of boron atoms have this mass in AMU. Translation, 80% of boron in nature is boron 11, and 20% is boron 10. Calculate the average atomic mass for boron, please. Pause. We did this before with apples, if you remember. 14 apples with this weight, 10 apples with this weight, and 76 apples with this weight. Add the apples together, you get 100. Then 14 over 100, 10 over 100, 76 over 100. You multiply each type of apples by its weight, and then you get an answer. Add them together, you get the weighted average. Or you can simply do it this way. First group of apples times their weight. Second number of groups of apples times their weight. And third number of groups of apples times their weight over the total, which is 100. Since they said percentage, so we assume that the total is 100. Okay, what's the first type of boron? We say 80%. And you multiply this by the weight, which is 11.0093 AMU. And then what? Close the parentheses. And then you add this to 20%, 20 over 100, times 10.0129 AMU. 
and the rest is math history. The end result is 10.81 atomic mass unit. That's how we get the weighted average. By the way, since they gave you percentages already, there is an easier way to do it. You can just say 80% is 0 0.8 and you multiply this by 11.0093 AMU plus 20%, so 0 0.2 times 10.0129. You do not need to put anything in the denominator because I already considered this here, and you do the math, you get the same answer. Next question. If a molecule of galactose has six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms, what's the molecular formula and what's the empirical formula? Okay, molecular formula. Just give me the exact numbers of atoms. Oh, I have C6 and H12 and O6, as they told me. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. Empirical is about simplifying it mathematically speaking divide each one by six so you get c one i will not write the one h two o that's the empirical formula molecular formula empirical formula next what's the predicted bond between hydrogen and oxygen in the compound h2o2 or hydrogen peroxide please pause answer since hydrogen is a non-metal and oxygen is a non-metal, therefore they will form a covalent or molecular bond. Ionic bond will form between a metal and a non-metal, which is not applicable here. Metallic bond, by definition, is between metals, not non-metals. Next, can you write the symbol for the ion with a plus one charge or positive one charge whose atomic number is 19 and mass number 39? Easy. Look at your periodic table. I want the atomic number of 19. So go to element number 19. Who's element number 19? Mr. Potassium. And what's the mass number they gave me? 39. I put 39 on top and then they want it to be a positive one cation. So you just write it like this, bingo. Can you do this one? Write the symbol of the cation with 24 electrons, 30 neutrons, and three plus charge. Let me know your answer in the comments. You'll find the answer key in the next video in this chemistry quick review playlist. Are you struggling with the math, the equations, the graphs of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics? Then you can download my general pharmacology course. It will help you cruise through these topics like a sharp knife in warm butter. Download it today at medicosisperfectionalis.com. You can also download my chemistry notes on the same website. By joining my membership program on YouTube, you can get instant access to more than 300 premium videos if if you choose the highest tier. Smash like, subscribe, hit the bell, support my channel here or here, go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine and chemistry make perfect sense.